Welcome back to the Gruber Morning Show. I'm Pete Gruber. And I'm Zane Courtney. And we're here to entertain you today. The picture behind us is uh, at the Wrigley Mansion in Phoenix, Arizona. We just uh, told our TikTok guys about that. There we go. Yeah, we did. And uh, what's beautiful about that, and maybe I can help relay a bit of the story since sure. I just got to learn that. So it was in, uh, it was started by the same Wrigley that started the chewing gum um, empire business. The, yeah. yeah, truly the empire. Um, this was back in what the, did you say the fifties? You know, I before didn't, that, I don't know. Yeah, it was, um, it was in the last century. I think it was around the middle or so. That but, sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we decided to build a big old mansion up in North Phoenix while it was still sort of the boonies. And uh, it's a beautiful drive nowadays where it's been converted into a mansion and restaurant hotel. Uh, it's a restaurant mostly, I think. Mm -hmm. And the banquet all, hall, yeah. Banquet hall <clears throat> um, with beautiful switchbacks and, and a great place to go and photograph these cars, especially this one, which is hilariously chrome, as you can see. And uh, it's a beautiful piece because there's not many other roadsters wrapped in chrome, if any. It's, it's actually the only chrome roadster we're aware of. The owner calls it the Silver Surfer. <laughs> and as I pointed out earlier, driving this thing in the middle of summer in Phoenix is dangerous because oh, yeah. you're blinding a lot of people. But I'll be darned if it doesn't look cool. <laughs> it looks absolutely cool. What this particular, um, uh, what this roadster owner also did was, he put plexiglass panels into certain areas, like the battery behind the seats, put LEDs in there so you can see the inner workings of the battery. Then he put a plexiglass top on the power electronics module where all the circuit boards are. Again, lit that with LEDs. And the final thing he had done, which we did this last trip to our service center, he had us put lights underneath the car. Oh, there we go. So when he's driving yeah, at the night, undercarriage. The seat, it actually glows. Uh, <laughs> and um, it looks like a spaceship, basically. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> it's a, it is the UFO. Uh huh. <laughs> now, this is a middle aged guy that did what every high school kid would do to their first car, and my hat's off to him. You know, it was, it was well done. So, the Wrigley Mansion, uh, yeah, you can see all of Phoenix from up here. It's, uh, it has enough elevation. And it's one of my favorite places to take the uh, roadsters when I test drive them and if I do any pictures. Beautiful. Yeah, we got a lot of fun stuff to talk about <clears throat> most recently. Uh, we've also got to do a bunch of collaborations. We've had our own uh, unique Tesla news. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff we could do, kind of recap real quick. First of all, um, we, do you want to talk Tesla Semi real quick? Yeah, we got to see that. CSNBC just put out their own segment on the Tesla Semi, but we kind of got to that first. We did, yes, and it was uh, quite happenstance in the neighborhood here. Guys were driving around collecting well, B-roll for videos, and suddenly this silent, gigantic truck drives by them on one of our streets here in our commercial uh, complex. And uh, then they realized the reason for the silence was it wasn't the diesel, it wasn't the gas-powered engine, it was a Tesla Semi that was here to have a wrap put on the trailer portion so it could be taken to the Super Bowl for advertisement for Frito-Lay. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also just got to do a great collaboration with The Automotive Woman. Great channel on YouTube. She's a Canadian YouTuber, makes great car content, in, um, mostly in the vein of someone like Supercar Blondie. And she got to come down to Phoenix and got to talk to Pete about the Tesla Roadster. Yeah, guys, that was a great video. Throw up a picture of that. If you're interested, look uh, on YouTube, The Auto Woman. And um, what we had was uh, we posted this on Facebook on a few sites. And uh, someone from Ireland came in and uh, commented and said, <clears throat> when I posted this and said that the original Tesla Roadster was really made um, in the UK, in Hethel, UK, the first 11. And then from there, they began shipping empty gliders to um, Menlo Park, California, to have them electrified. Well, she said, really cool. I never realized that the first cars were built by Lotus here in the UK. She always wanted a Lotus at least, but never managed to get her hands on one. So my comment to that was, um, the Lotus legacy with the Tesla Roadster runs deep and a bit deficient in credit. Lotus brought decades of engineering and production ex expertise to a bunch of novices at Tesla at the time, which out, without which it is doubtful we would have had an EV revolution. And what I meant by that was, in the early days of Tesla, it was a collection of technicians, engineers, uh, very passionate, dedicated people, none of which really had any kind of lengthy expertise in building cars. And we're talking about engineering, supply chain, production issues. Um, and Tes and uh, Lotus really brought a lot of that type of expertise to jumpstart uh, the whole Tesla program. So. 
a lot of credit to Lotus for being there and also building these first 11 Tesla Roadsters and doing some of this um, scouting that helped Tesla enormously later on to build these cars in California at Menlo Park. And of oh, course, just... later on, the Model S and some of the other cars that are coming out now. Looks like we've got a few questions from TikTok. Yeah, we've got some great ones. Here we go. From Don't Be on TikTok, I would love if someone came up with a plug-in inverter, plug and play. And I agree. In fact, there's actually something like that happening right now, thanks to more can wonderful Canadians in the auto industry. Um, uh, project, whoa, goodness me, what was it called? Uh, but it's a whole project dedicated to actually building an external charger so you don't actually build it into the vehicle anymore. Chargers outside the vehicle just shoots in the electricity straight to the battery. It could revolutionize being able to plug and play. You're probably talking about a supercharger now, a direct DC path. Well, that's the also well. They, they do exist. Yeah. Um, no, it's um, Project Arrow. I think is uh, the Canadian startup in there. It's a separate. Um, yeah, it's obviously not Tesla. It's a whole uh, company, and it's it's part of Canada's initiative to be able to create essentially a super. Um, Compliance car is mm -hmm. it's basically what's going on, and that's part of that. So I thought that was interesting that he mentioned having an external inverter to as part of that process because it seems like it's a popular idea. Sure, you know the uh, Ford F one fifty actually is um, vehicle to house. Yes, and it has a full plug and play uh, um, a set of outlets, so you can essentially uh, have electricity wherever the truck goes. And that came in real handy during Hurricane Ian when the utility dropped power and people had refrigerators and freezers and, uh, you know, needs to either heat or cool, um, cook, whatever. And this truck was able to supply power, at least in one instance, for four days. Yeah, yeah, that was a great story. House, yeah. And uh, there's been recent <clears throat> news that Rivian is actually going to be able to uh, start vehicle to home with a software update. Mm -hmm. um, which I think I thought was interesting because I thought you had to have specific hardware for um, being able to relay that inform um, electricity, but sure. uh, maybe not. Yeah. So very cool. LinkedIn from Juan Carlos Mortaya. Hi from Guatemala. Best regards. Good to see you again. Um, from Tom Reed on TikTok. Sunglasses indoors. Creepy and suspicious. Oh, okay. Um, Tom, maybe I suggest put More on fashion. these sunglasses. And maybe you'll see what we're seeing. It is a little overcast today in Phoenix, so it would be particularly dark out yeah. if we were to be outside with them, to be fair. From Sura on TikTok, uh, Santa Rose. Thank it is you, Valentine's sir. Day. Very nice of you. So we've got some news items here. Volvo Trucks apparently Ooh. has doubled down on electrification for its truck line. And uh, it is manufacturing uh, trucks at this point, 16 to 44 tons, different uses for city distributional, uh, regional haulage, uh, and the company is committed to reaching a target of half of its total sales being electric by 2030. That's ambitious. Hats off to Volvo. And you know who else to do it? Because Volvo already makes trucks and semis. They already have mm -hmm. electrification going on in their commercial department. That's the next step. They're doing the Tesla approach. The next goal for them is the um, achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 2040. So in 17 years or so, they plan to be completely uh, fossil fuel free. Um, what they ended up doing was uh, making, and can we throw that picture up? A um, electric cement truck. That one kind of blew my mind. Um, Look at that. Yeah, these things are pretty heavy. They're big. And, and it's course, cab over. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. And see, that speaks to something I've been thinking about for a long time, Pete. I keep thinking that if nothing else, electric semis and electric commercial trucks are the best thing to have within cities. And the best kind of truck to have in cities is typically cab overs because you don't have a long nose. You have to try to swerve around tight corners and things like that. Sure. That is a beautiful truck. <laughs> so what they made these, um, these uh, cement trucks for, their first customer apparently was Cemex which uh, you may have heard, they're a global construction materials company that uh, definitely are in the concrete business and the aggregate business. Um, they uh, announced their goals, CMEX, to, uh, they're aiming for a 47% reduction in carbon dioxide emission by the end of the decade. So in seven years, they're going to, only half of their vehicles will be fossil fuel burners. Um, the collaboration between Volvo and CMEX apparently is a long one. It started in 2021. 
And uh, here, here's the interesting thing about this particular uh, truck. It's called a Volvo FMX electric heavy duty truck. And it was supplied to CMEX at an event in Berlin, Germany. It features two motors that can output the total of 330 kW with energy supplied by four batteries. Now remember, to give you some perspective, the biggest uh, batteries in vehicles, um, uh, cars or sedans right now is about 100 kW, the P100 and the Lucids. So 333 is three times that much. But remember, what they need to do is power not only a heavy truck, but also that concrete drum. And it turns out that that is also getting its power from one of the traction batteries. Hmm. So Very hats off to Volvo and CMEX for thinking green and uh, moving in the right direction. Love um, to see it. And uh, we got some more love coming in from Create New World on YouTube. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? And then Sura, the one that sent us the roses, or the rose, sent two more. Aww. She says that she's from Kurdistan. She loves Tesla. Tesla is the best car. Wow, from Kurdistan. Sarah. Very cool. Oh, here we go. Well, let's see. I'll take them from TikTok. You can have one. Thank you. I have one. Oh, it smells good. And this one's for you, boys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, from Create New World, do you have any online classes? I'd love to join classes for uh, learning about Teslas. You know, we don't have an online class program yet. We are working on tutorials or videos. But... I can give a plug to um, uh, um, the Electrified Garage, um, who now do have classes that you can sign up for, and I believe they're on site. Uh, I don't know if they have an online curriculum yet, but um, they're um, so they are available. And uh, you know, hats off to Electrified Garage for putting something together. Very cool. Hey, here's a good one for you guys, specifically from Stephen Rose on YouTube. Hey, Stephen from Nevada. Are there companies that offer in-wheel motors? And that is a very particular topic. Yes. Well, the two companies familiar. that we're very familiar with are Solo Electromechanica, uh, which has a three-wheel car built here in uh, Casa Grande, Arizona. Technically, it's a motorcycle, <clears throat> legally speaking. Exactly, <laughs> which surprised me when we were at the Concourse for the Hills we were talking about its construction, and I noticed the roll bar on the inside, and they said, well, it's a three-wheeler, and uh, it is classified motorcycle, which makes the, in the insurance rates cheaper. Um, the second one, of course, of uh, some noteworthy, um, uh, or at least popular here in the United States, is Aptera, the solar car uh, in California. And uh, those also use in-wheel motors, and there are others around the world. Mm -hmm. And if you guys missed it, we just put out of it, well, we being uh, the beautiful production guys here, just put out a video on in-wheel motors on the main channel. So be sure to check that out on YouTube. It's live now. Absolutely. Good stuff. You wanted to mention something about more uh, other big Tesla news being happening in Germany. What's going on over there? Well, um, it turns out that the Germans are at it again, and uh, Tesla is trying to put covered parking at the Giga Berlin factory. And not only is Diabolical. it going to be covered parking <laughs> to provide shade for the vehicles, but they're putting solar panels on this covered parking. So it's a totally go green effort. The problem is they're running into bureaucratic red tape again. And if you remember, we put out a video on this a year or so ago, when, Tesla, um, when Giga Berlin was not yet up and running, it was over two years, and Shanghai in China was uh, a larger factory and was actually built in less than a year, just under 12 months. That's pretty good. And what was slowing down the German construction was lots of red tape, lots of bureaucratic wrangling, uh, environmental groups trying to protect frogs and snakes in the forest and trees that were going to be cut down. Now the issue is groundwater. What we have here is stakes that are, putting, that are being put in the ground about a meter deep. That's three feet, all right? And these stakes, of course, will support the covered parking structure. The problem they are now facing is the environmental groups are complaining because these stakes may affect groundwater. And the construction of this factory was actually in a groundwater protected area. So um, at this point, they have halted construction. 
It turns out Tesla may have also contributed to this problem because they did not get the necessary approvals to go down three feet for these stakes. Maybe they didn't realize that that was going to be an issue. Three feet doesn't seem that deep. It doesn't I, say here. Hmm. I, yeah, it's not a, you'd think it'd be a more common issue than with most pe construction, you know, because I think you dig about three feet for just about everything you build nowadays. <laughs> so, so it's, yeah, seems like a very targeted problem. I'll put it that way. So the, um, the feeling there is, is at least from the group that is uh, uh, lobbying to halt construction until some studies can be done, that um, this construction effort was completely inadequate and Tesla can apparently do what it wants. It was a political mistake to set up the factory in the water protection area. And uh, some groups are coming out now, water protection groups. We are pleased that the competent authority has now stopped illegal construction work due to undeniable facts. You know, what my video said a year ago is, guys, I'm German. I get this predisposition and this, this uh, rule following mentality. But what we're doing here is trying to save the planet. And maybe the, the frogs and the groundwater and the, and, the, and the snakes and a little bit of forest being cut down, which will be replenished, isn't quite as important as helping save this planet by creating factories that are able to put out fossil-free uh, type transportation. Um, so anyway, my advice to the Germans again is, if you want more factories being built in your country, let's ease up on these strict requirements and work with companies like Tesla that are trying to rapidly change what's going on on this planet. My advice. And there's going to be people that still care about all the animals and the wildlife that exist there, so that's going to be preserved somehow, and hopefully we'll, there is good effort to make that happen anyways. And luckily that there's enough conscientiousness about that thing to make that happen. So, yeah, I think there's a scenario where everybody can win. So, I'm with you. So, Tesla is also wrapping up the, um, uh, the hiring at the German factory. Last December, it was producing 3,000 Model Ys per week. Guys, that's 3,000 fossil fuel burners that are being replaced every week. That's a significant number. We need more of that. Mm. We need cooperation. It's also fascinating that that is still making up for the backlog, that Tesla is still backlogged. People have still already purchased the vehicle. They're just trying to fulfill demand. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible. You know, we actually got a comment from our friend in um, Kurdistan. There's, a, there's one Tesla in her whole city. Mm -hmm. But still, the fact that they're, you know, going out into pretty much everywhere, I think, is something incredible. So it's, it's moving. They're moving around. So it looks like we've got a YouTube visitor, Bernard Homan. Saludos del Toluco, Mexico. Gracias. Y buenos días. And then Facebook, Jiminy Stack is joining us. He's saying Aptera US. He's probably responding to R3 which remote. companies make in-wheel or use in-wheel motors in their vehicles. You know, something that was talked about a little, I think, in your video, but and, and also to bring up with in-wheel motors is people complain that, well, they're just not going to be able to um, be as efficient if the, as the motors, if uh, compared to a motor that's mm -hmm. directly connected to a transaxle because you have to now put all that energy into spinning the wheel instead of just something that'll spin the wheels for it. There was something about that. I think engineering explained when a little bit into those. Um, but in-wheel motors have been around forever. Yeah, 1901 is when Ferdinand Porsche first put one of those on a car. Yep, go watch our video. Watch our video. Watch the yeah, video. <laughs> you'll see the history on this. So it's not new technology. It's being revived and it's beginning to look like it's making a lot of sense. Now, granted, as our video, we got a lot of comments, by the way, and we'll share those in future podcasts, but a lot of comments about sprung and unsprung weight and the advantages and the disadvantages and the maintenance issues and what if you hit a pothole. With any new technology like this, folks, it requires innovation, engineering, and problem solving. The fact that uh, you have reduced the amount of weight in a vehicle and put the propulsion in the wheel where it eventually ends up seems to make a lot of sense. And we have some, um, we have design challenges to solve, but um, that's what uh, engineers are paid to do. And uh, there will be some better product that's coming out. And as these smaller cars like the Aptera and um, uh, the Electromechanica Solo start hitting the streets, people will warm up to this uh, technology a bit more. 
And uh, it looks like we're going to see more of it in vehicles, other types of EV vehicles. We got a few more comments. Um, our friend Sura mentioning, yep, the, oh, only Tesla in the city. Thank you again for your roses. Um, YouTube Shorts, Igor Koske. He says one meter is 3.3 feet. Thank that's you for correct. pointing that out. So it's a little bit more than three feet and uh, affecting the groundwater in Berlin. And Max is watching on Instagram. What's up, buddy? You're welcome, Max. You need to join us. Are you going to be here Thursday? Part of the production team? <laughs> He's going to answer that. In a if moment. nothing else, come say hi just for me. I yeah. love being selfish. Uh, and oh, here's a great one on uh, Instagram from Doorman. Dorm, door, doorman, doorman MD. Ah, there we go. That sounds right. Love the way you guys embrace the industry. You discuss all the brands, both good and bad. Love the podcast. Thank you for your comment, Dorman. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, from Igor on YouTube Shorts. The Model right, Y right now is almost impossible to get, unfortunately. Long time wait on reservations. Yep, again, it's going back to that backlog thing. So Giga Berlin is going to be increasingly more important mm -hmm. as they're still trying to fulfill those demands. And production capacity continues to grow and build, and a lot is under construction. So hopefully, eventually, the demand and supply will even out a bit. But for now, uh, what's encouraging is the EV adoption is well underway, and it's uh, exponential from what uh, you know anyone really thought when they first started making EVs. There's a company called Central Electric Group Limited that has begun to assemble battery packs and uh, for their vehicles. We've got a picture of that vehicle, I think. Is Centro um, in the lineup? Let me check real quick here. I don't think so. No, it's not. All right, never mind, guys. It's sort of a boxy-looking vehicle, but again, it's an EV. What they're using, those lithium iron phosphate LFP battery cells with their proprietary battery management technologies. And um, the LFP cells are attracting a lot of interest with all of the other manufacturers as well because the resulting battery packs offer longer life cycle, faster charge rate, along with safer operations. Translated, that means they don't catch fire quite as often and as uh, violently as lithium ion battery That's packs. a great problem not to have. <laughs> it is, yes. Um, so they feel that by manufacturing their own battery packs, they hope to enhance supply chain efficiency, improve battery resilience, and have more control over one of the most strategic elements in the supply chain, being, of course, batteries. Mm -hmm. And it's also worth knowing that this specific chemistry makes it a little challenging to integrate everywhere since they are considerably heavier um, than uh, lithium-ion batteries or other things like even um, aluminum batteries and things like that. But they're great for other applications. Yeah, absolutely. Looks like a YouTube comment. Stephen Rose, how are you? You're joining us again. Uh, what are our thoughts on salt water or salt, salt battery. battery technology? Yeah. We talked about that in the last podcast, and I realized that I made a commitment to research that a bit more, and I didn't do it. So all we know at this point is, is that there is a, a technology that is evolving at this point, and um, don't have many, we don't have many details. But if this truly is a viable technology, uh, now we've got a mineral that is probably one of the most plentiful on Earth, sodium chloride. And uh, we could even um, uh, go into the oceans and get some of that if we needed to, if we ran out of it on land, which yeah, is highly sure. powerful. Yeah, sure. Always right? to borrow a little bit from the sea. Yeah. Uh, Undecided with Matt Farrell is a great YouTube channel, and he actually talks a lot about the new up-and-coming battery technologies, including mm -hmm. salt batteries. And it's interesting to know because you have salt, you've got sodium, but lithium is also an element contained within most salt. And that's how we're able to extract it in the first place. And I love that you actually mentioned you're from Nevada because Nevada has a very important lithium source. We've talked about it several times on this show. Uh, and if we're able to one day actually tap into that, make it more efficient, plus having redwood materials there also in Nevada, uh, we could see the whole state become something of a great EV uh, battery enterprising state. Um, and so there's a lot to consider, a lot to follow in the state of Nevada. We've got something for you on the Chinese balloon. Can you guys throw that picture up? I was shocked to see that in California, apparently, the same balloon before they shot it down or what? that balloon after they shot it and it migrated the to California. The balloon's back. There, there's a picture of it driving in California. This was actually from a friend of mine in California that posted this on Facebook. And the caption down below says, I followed this thing for a few miles before I realized that it was bird poop on my windshield. <laughs> All right, a little bit of humor there. 
That was from Jeff Rosevear, by the way. Jeff was... Um, but you believed it too, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. It looks pretty convincing. Jeff, um, as I uh, <laughs> You're like, started to mention, he, uh, he was a 14-year veteran at Tesla, one of the original supply chain guys there, was there during the early days when they were working very closely with Lotus. And, uh, oh, he has some interesting stories to tell. He's now retired. In summer of last year, he retired. Uh, great guy. Uh, Seems like a fun guy. Yeah. And... Um, Someday you're going to have to write a book, Jeff. Uh, some of the stories about the early days at Tesla are just captivating and fascinating. We'll get him on the show. Why not? We'll, yeah. let's, let's, we'll figure when it out. When you're in Phoenix and he says he'll come someday, hey. we'll definitely put you on our podcast and you can tell us all about it. Uh, Igor on YouTube Shorts, what's your outlook on the future of failing national electric grids in America? It's way slower on making improvements than the growing EV adoption rate. Yeah, the grid it always comes back when we talk about discussions on EVs and their adoption, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, and we, we did a video, Igor, on this very topic, and we felt like you did that, the, uh, that we're in trouble, that uh, the EV adoption rate is uh, outpacing the ability for the utilities to grow their infrastructure. And we researched, I think a couple of weeks or so, we researched this and found that uh, the opposite is true. There are a number of initiatives within utilities and um, switching over to clean energy, for example, incorporating solar, um, where the problem does not seem to be as severe as people are assuming that it will be. Um, the utilities are keeping up, and not just in the US, globally. So um, if you have a specific country, for example, or region where that's becoming a problem, we'd certainly like to hear about it. But uh, currently, the consensus is that uh, the grid, surprisingly enough, is keeping up with the uh, explosion of electric vehicles. Pete, um, real quick, I'm gonna pull this up so you guys can see it. Sure. This video right here is where we pulled a lot of our info. This guy did a really good- um, There he is, engineering explained. Detailed deep dive Love on that guy. whether or not the grid can handle it. So if you want the specifics and the, the math and the numbers, you can go look at that or you can watch our video. Well, that's another guy we got again on the show, huh? What's his name? Uh, the channel name is Engineering Explained. Engineering Explained. I always okay. forget I his, think somebody gave I forget his, his real name, <laughs> his, his legal name. Well, you have a link to it at least, and uh, you, can, you can go watch that then if you like. Okay. Well, um, what else do we have here? Oh, the um, Anthony Ba, Love the Morning Show, from YouTube Shorts. Thank you for joining us. You know, our YouTube Shorts channel is really taking off uh, compared to the long videos we do. Those shorts uh, just get a lot of traction and a lot of interest. If you're curious about all things Tesla and EV, it's a great channel to go to because I think we've captured the majority of issues that could arise with a Tesla, and uh, people are loving it. Um, yeah, and speaking of, Igor's back on YouTube Shorts. Now, he raises something really cool, and, and yeah. or not, well, not cool, but um, important, I should say, and it could lead to something cool. So he mentions that last summer you had blackouts in California, a lot of brownouts too, mm -hmm. when the government were t had told them not to charge their cars for multiple hours. Sure. And, and you know what? I, I probably should have prefaced that, that, that uh, there were pockets. And California, even before the EV revolution, had rolling brownouts and blackouts. Yep. The infrastructure there just is not uh, uh, sufficient. And of course, because of their financial difficulties, let's just say that, uh, the ability to improve infrastructure has always been constrained. So California is probably the best example of a potential problem with EV adoption rates. And then you compound that with the fact that uh, Tesla is in California. Yep. And uh, I was in Fremont three, four years ago, and we were counting Teslas. And every minute you saw a Tesla sitting at a light, you'd see a couple of them queuing up left, right. It didn't matter. Um, so yes, California... Uh, will have some problems until they continue to, or continue to increase their their um, their infrastructure. Everybody points to California as the prime example of why EVs should not be adopted. You see it all the time. Well, it's like we can't go straight to EVs. Look at California. The brown they point to the blackouts and things. Guys, California is a living paradox. It's a place with bad infrastructure and an over demand for EVs. And remember, so, it's also the first state that mandated that's that right. by 2035, yeah, that's right. no more ICE cars will be sold or manufactured. Yeah, so, so, they, so they must have a plan. 
is what we're saying. Well, least. they're hoping, <laughs> but you know, so yeah, we're keeping that in mind. We have these discussions about you know the grid when we're talking about you know, adoption rates. And by the way, what's really what I hope, and we talked about it at the beginning of this podcast, was yeah. um, when it comes to technologies like vehicle to home. Let's say mm -hmm. now with an adoption rate of these cars that have the ability to be external electric storage. Imagine if, you know, even just the whole city of Phoenix, let's say everybody had an EV in the right. state, state of Phoenix. Guys, that's an entire electric grid that's completely external from the grid. So it's almost like doubling up on whatever the potential electrical capacity we had. And that's been possible in the last 20 years compared to the first 100 years of electrical uh, uh, grid it's being on. Yeah. 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 We've got a YouTube Shorts comment from Anthony By again. He says, I love how you loop them. He's talking about our YouTube Shorts videos. The Shorts ending leads right into the beginning. Excellent production. Hey, now, that's you guys. Yeah, let me give you a perspective on this. Um, I'm over there, uh, you know, doing a lot of these videos. And I've got Richard here, who is the Shorts looping pro. And what he'll tell me is, okay, so here's what you say at the beginning, and of course it has nothing to do with the ending, or the ending has nothing to do with the beginning, although when it loops, to make a long story short, he's much better at looping these things and being able to recall how this is going to seamlessly go together, because by the time I start talking, I'm lost. So hats <laughs> off to Richard, because he often cues me and tells me what to do. Well, I appreciate Post that, Pete. It's a lot more difficult than than it than it seems you know it's, it's an art you see like you'll you'll see other people do a certain form of content loops included or transitions or whatever and you you only get to see that for the 30 seconds that it's there and you're like oh my gosh that's so simple and you yeah. know that's how yeah. we should do it and then you go and try to recreate it and you're like oh my gosh yeah yeah There's we take we take so much involved. video production not, for granted yeah <laughs> that's yeah. for sure but I'm glad you like those uh, uh was it anthony um, Anthony Ba, yeah. Yeah, glad you like him. Appreciate that. And uh, Richard, by the way, does a fair share of those shorts as well. So if you want to see some high quality looping, uh, he is the king and the pro in our production team on that. So, so much right. love being spread and shared this Valentine's Day. This so a police <laughs> chief in Somerset, Wisconsin, we've talked about this before. Um, they started to switch over their police cars to Model Ys. There we go. And if you remember, uh, this made the headlines. He said, a single electric vehicle will save the town $80,000. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about where he comes up with those numbers and what the advantages are. The first thing, of course, is reducing operating costs and environmental impact with these vehicles. Um, and they are using Model Ys. Uh, the um, reason that they chose a Model Y is financial reasons, and he lists a bunch of uh, topics here as to why this was uh, chosen. No oil change is pretty obvious. Any EV is not going to require oil changes, all right? Regenerative braking. Um, well, that's a cool feature. I don't know how it uh, changes or creates benefits in a police car. Well, it doesn't. It saves um, energy on brakes, actually puts energy back into the battery so you can use the vehicle longer. There was something of a controversy about whether or not a police car fully electric would be able to keep up with a criminal that's mm -hmm. blasting out of town. But um, Well, I think you hit on something. I don't know why I forgot, but yeah, regenerative braking saves your brakes. Uh, we've got Tesla Model S customers. One of them is pushing 200,000 miles, and he still has his original brakes. Yeah. You can't do that with an ICE engine. Unreal. You know, much heavier. Um, he says the battery designed for a half a million miles. Well, okay. Um, uh, Drivetrain motors designed for one million miles. I think those are probably the optimistic projections, but um, if the Model Y really has improved to the point where this is realistic and probably won't know for until cars get to a million miles, we'll see. Now keep in mind, police cars tend to, uh, they're, they're, the life cycle of a police car is that it sits for a long time mm -hmm. active, uh, and then every, every once in a while, that's where it has to spring into action and, and uh, utilize all the torque that it has to be able to, you know, chase someone down. So, you know, it actually, when you put it into perspective of what the actual use case is, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. He talks about the five-year, 125,000-mile drivetrain and battery warranty. And, you know, something that I learned from this is um, I assumed that uh, police cars were high mileage usage. Um, 
It turns out that the 300 miles range on this Model Y is not an issue for this particular police department because he says their, uh, their, their officers average about 30 to 60 miles per shift. So oh, even you two go. shifts, you're still under that 300 limit. Um, so the uh, warranty would probably also be closer to five years. Um, instead of being, uh, you know, expired at 125,000 miles in a shorter period of time. He says most are American-made vehicles. Well, that's true, at least with Tesla. And like most government uh, bidding opportunities, uh, made in America is a very strong clause, uh, especially with federal and federal contractors. So I'm not sure how the um, Somerset Police Department feels about that, but a lot of these government installations mandate made in the U.S., so it kind of locks out the foreign EVs. Um, highest crash test rating, again, important safety issue. Superior performance. He doesn't elaborate here, but I'm assuming that the zero to 60 might help. Hey. Catch a speeder. Electric torque. Yeah. And uh, long vehicle life. Again, it's um, uh, empirical data that will evolve as these cars are out in the field, but it has already been proven that electric vehicles do have a longer lifespan than ICE vehicles. And longer than anticipated in mm -hmm. most cases. I mean, look at the Roadster itself. A lot of them are from 2012 and they're still going. They also kicked in a number of um, uh, funding and um, credits. And uh, these particular vehicles were purchased using the American Rescue Plan Act Fund. So for the rest of you that are uh, with police departments, maybe that's something you can look into to help reduce the cost of the vehicles. They applied for funding from an LEA grant, as well as donations to the purchase. So <clears throat> the actual vehicle price, after all of the enhancements were done to it, remember you have to put special stuff into a cop car, uh, was about $60,000, so it's more than an average passenger sedan. Uh, but they, they're, they're very convinced that it'll save them $80,000 per vehicle throughout a 10-year life duty cycle. Well, we'll see what happens, but yeah, I mean, good luck to all of them. It's cool to see that there's some innovation in kind of all yeah. aspects of life. So there was a local car show here. Can you guys throw up a picture of the key fob? Mm -hmm. And... Um, a friend of mine here locally who goes to a lot of the car events, like I used to, Brenda Pretty, um, took a picture of this uh, car and it immediately said to me, key fob, that's what Tesla was using as a model for that key fob. And uh, so anyway, I put this out on Facebook and uh, I don't have any comments yet, but ever wonder what might have inspired the Tesla key fob design? This is a 1953 Alfa Romeo Bertone Bat 5 Coupe. Um, and it looks that is like a, a Batmobile, that's for sure. Yeah, it is. It looks like a pretty aerodynamic vehicle. You know, I was telling Pete just before the show, as soon as he pulled up the image, I'd seen it from a little bit of a distance, and I thought, I, I thought that the image on the left there was the Alfa Romeo, and I thought, oh, that looks hilariously like a key fob. On the right. And yeah. then it blew it up, and I was like, oh, it is. <laughs> With uh, red buttons, that probably would be the case, wouldn't it? How cool. That'd be yeah. kind of rad. Do something like a like a rat rod or classic style Tesla. And isn't it Make amazing that back in 1953, that kind of styling was available? Yeah, boy. You actually built a car. People made you know? some weird, fun, wacky stuff between yeah. the 50s and the 70s, I think. Boy, that was a cool age of cars. Oh, in the 50s, cars looked like bricks. There was no aerodynamics yeah, yeah. under consideration. In fact, um, some of these 50s, the tri-year 50 Chevys, uh, when people um, supercharged those or you know increased the top speed on those, one of the problems was they would occasionally blow out a windshield because of the amount of uh, air pressure. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so the picture that's behind us right now, we should probably talk about that again for the visitors that came in afterwards. This is the Wrigley Mansion in Phoenix, Arizona. It's up on a hill. You can uh, get, uh, there's enough elevation where you can see a 360 degree view of Phoenix. When it was built, it was out in the boondocks. Now it's central Phoenix, basically, um, in the uh, Biltmore region where the Biltmore uh, Five Star Resort is as well. And by the way, um, the, this is the same Wrigley of chewing gum uh, fame. 
And uh, who would have thought that you can, uh, you know, chewing gum would get you a it's mansion? It's the little on a things. Tell you what, five-star resort. And you know, like most rich guys, this isn't the only house that he has around the world. I'm right. sure there were other houses and maybe even a yacht thrown in. Real estate is real estate. But it's one of my favorite places to take Tesla Roadsters when I do a test drive and take pictures of them. And the and the Tesla Roadster behind us is called the Silver Surfer. It's the only chrome wrapped Roadster that we are aware of. And um, this customer actually not only chrome wrapped, but put lighting in there that really makes it a spectacular car. He has the battery box illuminated with a plexiglass front. He has the power electronics module full of circuit boards in the back with a plexiglass lid on it with LEDs on the inside. So you can see all of the electronics and the electrons zipping around, I suppose. And the last thing he had us do on the second trip to our shop and it's been here a couple of times over the last three years, is put lights underneath the car, LED lights, which uh, makes it glow at night. Um, so anyway, that's the um, picture we decided to choose for this uh, Pretty podcast. sure you can see the skyline, too. Uh, is that the downtown skyline off to the left there? It is. You yes. know, yeah, yeah, sure enough. I see you caught that. Yeah, at the very left there at the horizon, that is uh, some of the high-rise activity in downtown Phoenix. Phoenix downtown is probably about 20, yeah, about 20 miles away or so. You could easily see the reflection <laughs> off that chrome from there, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as I pointed out earlier, driving this car in the middle of summer in Phoenix can be a bit dangerous because you're blinding people. I didn't get anybody flashing their brights at me, but I think they wanted to. All they had to do was twist the wheel a little bit to get yeah. the... <laughs> that's right. awesome. Here's a great comment from Deep Value Options on YouTube Shorts. For people to move into solar and EVs, I, being devalued, thinks it's a matter of their consumer understanding both in how they'll under how they'll benefit them and save them tons of money over the long run. So yeah, consumer information and consumer education is going to be huge. I think as we move into this new era of energy uh, valuation and energy uh, consolidation, you know, it's going to be it's going to be important that everybody kind of knows what to look for. And you know you really get the best of both worlds because not only um, is there a financial incentive to go into this into this realm EVs and solar, but if you believe in climate change, which I don't think many people dispute anymore on this planet, um, it also helps resolve that or at least put us on track. Uh, Trucker Alistair on YouTube. Good morning, you guys. Rock, nice to see you all again. Good to see you, Trucker Alistair. Always good to see you, buddy. Uh, from Jimmy Stack on Facebook, Southern California used the Tesla virtual battery and had no problems this last year. Power walls to send power and save the grid. Tes Texas is signed up for that now. Yeah. In fact, in the last podcast, we talked about a uh, naval facility that actually was um, uh, that continued to operate when the power went out due to a storm, and uh, it ran for a day or two, I believe. So, yeah, it's... Um, there's some benefits, definitely. Yeah. It's another thing about having all these new external batteries that are coming out into the world, and they're fun to drive. Yeah. Igor Koski with YouTube Shorts points out, love the show. I also would love to hear respectful, civilized debates between ice car enthusiasts and EV enthusiasts. Yeah, those are interesting conversations. And I think on this show, I think, you know, between all of us in studio here, I think we've got a pretty good balance of, as to, you know, okay, if we're going to go into this industry, what's the most responsible way to do it? I don't think we're too shy about talking about some of the pitfalls that come with the EV mm -hmm. adoption as well. As we mentioned, some of the, um, you know, things that caught, you know, uh, cause controversy amidst disruption and things like that. And, you know, I, you know, we all have our personal takes on certain things. You know, I don't think all of us agree a hundred percent with each other on what that's going to look like, but, and it's tons of fun to make that happen. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were at the Concourse of the Hills in Fountain Hills last week, um, there were a number of EV um, cars represented their brands. And one that I had never heard of was a company called Draco, D-R-A-K-O. And if we can pop up that image. Uh, uh, Pete, real quick, can we, yeah. can we answer these two questions? We have questions related to the police car we need to address for. Oh, yeah, oh, let's yeah, go okay. ahead. Uh, okay, here we go. So, from Anthony Bond, YouTube Shorts. For police and ICE cars, must keep the engine running to keep up with the police computer, uh, computer communication systems. A 12-volt battery would die running that on its own, so the EV is superior, superior there. Yeah, and that's I think true. that's part of the modifications that they make to these police cars is to uh, boost the 12-volt uh, requirement. 
uh, yeah, you couldn't do that with just the single 12 volt battery in the um, in the EV. Yeah, it's why typically used police cars are sort of a red flag when it comes to buying something used. It's mostly because of the way that they get used. A lot of those times, yeah, those engines just sitting there idle. It's not good for the whole system to just kind of shake like that over time and then eventually have to get pushed really hard. So, yeah. you know, the wear and tear on those things tends to be pretty rough and EVs solve that problem almost unanimously. Uh, Deep Value Options also chimed in. It'd be funny if each Tesla police car could have a button to get to a Tesla Plaid type speed. Yeah, yeah. yeah you probably would reduce probably the them. number of felony uh, chase attempts because uh, what's the point? You're not going to win, you know? Um, interesting uh, point. And they need to go fast for a long time. A lot of these uh, police chases, they can last like five hours if they just find themselves on the highway and have to chase them for a little while. So yeah, having something fast at least, to, or something quick to catch up to them. So, so here's a YouTube Shorts comment, Anthony Ba. Uh, last week, I pointed out that at this Concourse of the Hills show, I happened to get stuck in a line that was a 35 minute line trying to get into this event, which is not uncommon, by the way. And in front of me was a very lopy Mustang mid, uh, you know, 60s uh, built engine, cammed heavily and uh, just spewing hydrocarbons. And I didn't want to create too big a gap between me and him. I'm used to clean air because I drive a Tesla Roadster, right? And the carbon monoxide was just stifling. So what Anthony Boss says, I have severe asthma. I'd love to, I'd love to debate an ice lover while I'm hooked up to oxygen. Um, I can tell you that my experience behind that Mustang was miserable. Now, in traffic... <laughs> that probably, one moment was enough. <laughs> it wouldn't matter that much because you have, you know, wind that's uh, carrying it away. But uh, for a half an hour, I sat there and, uh, you know, I was fighting off carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, you know, the bottom line is, guys, it, yeah, sure, there are debates on both sides of the fence here. Um, you know, climate change, uh, emission problems. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to get you to remember something. During the worst times of COVID, when people truly were terrified and staying indoors, in Phoenix, Arizona, we have a constant haze that permeates the valley. And from where I live, you can see South Mountain, but it's fuzzy, it's blurry. During those weeks of severe COVID uh, internment where people stayed in the home, the air miraculously cleaned up. Uh, at night and during the day. And I'd love the planet to get back to that, you know? Uh, just think of all of the health issues, the ones that are identified and unidentified that we may be subjected to because we're breathing poisonous air. So anyway, that's one strong argument uh, for sustainable transportation and renewable energy sources for transportation. To uh, also <coughs> chime in on our comment about having de these debates, you know, I, personally, you know, I think there might be a place for, for fossil fuel. I don't think it's in cars. Yeah. You know, at least for the most part. Now, that you know, obviously, this is not a law. This is something that we get to experiment with. It's a technology, so we get to see how, you know, we get to pursue oh, no, that. The laws are coming. Laws are coming. And even if you don't believe in it, it's a non-renewable resource. By 2050, we're running out of oil. So that's another compelling reason to, um, you know, move into another form of transportation. I'll pull up the uh, Draco stuff here too in a minute. And for all the other, you know, I mean, there's still many countries around the world that rely on, you know, these these big fossil fuels in order to keep up with uh, nations like ours that are able to thrive so much on the energy that we do have. So, sure. you know, if we go in something in a direction that's more, you know, sustainable given the fossil fuels that we've had before, well, that gives all these other countries the opportunity to use those same fuels to catch up and to benefit the whole planet. So, like I said, there's a place for it all. Uh, and I certainly am not one to say that, you know, only one size fits all. And I don't think any of us may be able to say that. So, you know, I'm optimistic for the future that as we continue to advance in this sort of uh, direction, that the whole world is going to be able to benefit. And again, it's uh, thanks in, to both technologies, yeah. fossil fuel, electric, uh, the kinds of renewable energies, all of it's going to help. So walking around with Richard at this Concourse of the Hills, 
you had your normal cars there. You know, you had the Lucid, you had Tesla, you had Electromechanica, you had the Ford F-150 Lightning, you had the Rivian pickup trucks, you know, you had a Polestar was there. And suddenly I'm looking at a car that looks like a, um, a pretty um, muscular, uh, you know, EV vehicle with the name Draco on it, D-R-A-K-O. So, like Malfoy, for all my Harry Potter fans. Yeah, so we, um, we, we asked, and uh, it turns out that uh, one of the co-founders of the company was at the show. He said, let me go get um, Shiv for you. And um, anyway, um, we then were able to interview one of the co-founders. His name is Shiv Seekend, and uh, they're from San Jose, California, by the way. Um, a couple of guys started this company that were into exotic cars. And hey, I'm going to pull the, this uh, commercial up. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, real pedigreed cars, too. Like, um, they own a 288 GTO Ferrari. I mean, that is like the holy grail in the Ferrari oh. world, right? Look but at this. But the reason they say they started this company was because they couldn't get what they wanted out of their other hyper cars. He didn't elaborate, at least in this uh, video it or in this interview. pretty high up for a hypercar. I wonder if it sits down. So this one's actually the, the SUV up. Well, that yeah. Oh, the that's what. Okay, post. okay, okay. This is the Gullwing SUV. Look at that. And it is a 100% carbon fiber construction. The first SUV that, uh, uh, that sports that. And um, very easy to get in with the Gullwing doors. They had them open at the show. And it just basically opens up the cabin where, you know, an, an army could probably march through this thing without like any a, obstruction. It, look, it reminds me of an EV6, but it sits higher up. Yeah. So interesting um, conversation with one of the co-founders. If you're interested, we've got a video coming out within the next few days. Check out, check out our YouTube channel and um, where he talks about the genesis of the company, what... Um, what uh, motivated them to build these two models and uh, what their production goals are. Uh, you'll also see the oh, cost of these the vehicles. Doors. There's gold wings. Yeah. $100,000. More than that. It's got gold wing doors. It's $100,000. This, one, this <laughs> one was around 300 some odd thousand dollars. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. But. And okay, the, pull up the next one. The, the GTE was the performance uh, car. Oh. And uh, this one is going to be $1.2 million, and they are taking pre orders. Um, the specs on this, by the way, it's, it's 1,200 horsepower with a quad motor design, top speed 206 miles an hour, and it is a four passenger vehicle. Of course, a luxury car. Um, <laughs> One of the reasons that they wanted to build some supercars like this was the uh, environmental impact with the cars that they're used to driving, the Lamborghinis and Ferraris and the, the Porsches, are, uh, as they fr or as he phrased it, just horrible. And um, so that's why they moved into the EVs. The, um, plus, he said he loves the electric torque. Uh, that's just one of the most exciting things uh, in a hypercar. And uh, you just don't get that with a nice car. Um, you know, I, I, I drove both. And, you say the uh, price on this one? 1.2 mil. 1.25. Yeah. 1.25 for, uh, for the GTE. Hmm. But um, if you're interested, check out our video. It'll be out in a few days. It was, uh, it was interesting uh, interviewing Shiv and getting the backstory on this whole uh, car and uh, the technology that they're using. Before we get to, uh, there's a great uh, number of comments that just came in, so I definitely want to get to those. But we were just talking before the show about Nuremberg and how at, um, you know, there's the track out there. And uh, we were talking about how, you know, EVs are known to be quick but not fast. The uh, Nuremberg kind of proved that the Porsche 911 is still kind of the king of the track because it's still able to go the furthest on a tank of gas and do it in the fastest time. Number two being a Model S, but it had to take into account, like, DC fast charging time, um, and they are able to corner quicker because they have a lower center of gravity and they have that instant torque. But because when you're taking into account all the charging time and things like that, they're not known to be particularly fast overall. So it, it kind of goes back to the police car discussion too. So we're talking uh, about the ring now in uh, in uh, Nuremberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's yeah, right. The Nuremberg ring. Um, has anyone taken a Lucid there yet? That Lucid Sapphire. Ooh, we have. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We'll have to look into that. You know, that, that's that'd, be one that's, that'd be interesting. It, I mean, it spanked uh, the four top-rated cars in the United States. Yeah. You know, the, 
uh, the Bugatti uh, Chiron, right? You know, $4.2 million car, uh, the sports bike, uh, Ducati, and of course a Tesla Model S Plaid. I think it was the Rimac Nevera that was there breaking all the records recently. Yeah, was it? yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a tough car to beat. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have some Instagram. Anwar is watching. Good morning, Anwar! Mr. Gruber. Bid hi to your friend from Kuwait. Oh, good to see go. you, Anwar. Uh, good to see you. Grace Hopper's Crunch on YouTube. Great uh, in-wheel motor cars video. Loved it. Yeah, thank there you. We'd love to get some love that on that. making. From Paratosh P on YouTube Shorts, how many Teslas do you own? Oh, well, um, you know, I, it sounds arrogant, but I lose track. Uh, we have roadsters, <laughs> and it depends. Let parts, me know if you have any to share. Yeah, running cars, parts <laughs> cars, uh, you know, it's... It, um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, so I have a few roadsters. I have some Model S's, um, but... Uh, and they're all fun cars. From Deep Value Options on YouTube Shorts, he's had the Model 3 and the Model S. Cool, okay. Right on. Let us know what yours. There's lots to pick from. Good times. Instagram, Bruno M. Matos. Good morning, my friends from Toronto, Canada. Hey, good morning to you. Love to see our Canadian friends. We just got to hang out with the automotive woman from Canada. She's from Toronto as well, yeah. Eric, uh, her social media guru, is from Montreal. You know, I thought he was from France. He has an accent. Well, yeah, and, it's uh, French side it, Canada. It turns out people in Canada have a French accent oh, if they're yes. from Montreal. Oh, uh, yes. Yep, they're proud of it, dude. Mm -hmm. From David Hartline on YouTube, what about, here we go, <laughs> yeah. anti-gravity propulsion. To save our planet, yep. Let's go for it. I'm, I'm I don't know how you even there with you, David. You know, how do you make that? <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about this, but <laughs> okay. we may have had a chance. We may have had a chance to uncover anti-gravity propulsion. Because if you remember, that last thing, cylindrical thing they shot down, they couldn't discover what, was, what the propulsion method was. All right, so what if this thing was sent to us by intelligent life forms somewhere else for us to reverse engineer? What do we do? We, we shoot put it, it in down. a car. We, we shoot it down instead, all right? Um, anyway, I'm, I'm about to go on a rant, but... Um, <laughs> Get I'm sure that for safety uh, reasons. Hats that, uh, ready. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer in anti gravity, and maybe this cylindrical object had it because um, you know they couldn't see what the uh, what the propulsion method was. Now, granted, they flew by there really fast. You know, these F somethings aren't slow, and uh, maybe, but maybe some high quality pictures first. Analyze those pictures. Look at uh, various angles, and then decide whether it's worthy of being shot down. Maybe there's a life form in there. Maybe the life form doesn't have the same frequencies we do here and isn't communicating with us. See, I'm going on a rant and I apologize. <laughs> I'm gonna calm down now. No, it's, okay. it's, that's totally okay, Pete. I just wanted to bring up, uh, Bill Wood had a comment. He says, it was an order of Chinese food I placed a week ago. It's very late. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Bill. <laughs> uh, Pete, just so you know, we are just over an hour. Woo! Okay. All right. Time flies by when you're having fun. Well, let's get to these last couple at least. Yeah. Um, oh, here's a, okay, so this is talking about uh, Grace Hopper's Crunch on YouTube. Has Gruber Motors ever sent or sponsored an EV up Pikes Peak or down any of the dry lakes or running cannonballs? I'll volunteer his Aptera <laughs> launch edition once it arrives. Yes, <laughs> and it's not us, but let me tell you a cool story. We have a T0 here. T0 was one of three electric vehicles that was made in 1997 by AC Propulsion Systems. If you're curious about its history, go to our YouTube channel, look up the T0 video. There's one at the Peterson Auto Museum right now. It is a legendary vehicle because it is the vehicle that inspired Martin Eberhardt and Mark Tarpening to start Tesla. And later on, Elon went to see them and he was inspired to join Tesla because of the T0. All right, so it has a lot of history. The previous owner of the car that I bought, the T0, it was um, briefly in private ownership and then I bought it, um, was that they took this thing up to Pikes Peak, all right, the first EV ever to, uh, you know, do Pikes Peak. And they drove it all the way to the top and they realized, you know, we don't have enough juice to get back down the hill because it had lead acid batteries and the, um, uh, the range on this was only 80 miles on a flat surface. When you're doing switchbacks and going up a mountain, you know, you're going to be using a lot of oh, energy. Yeah. So what they did was they plugged the car in up at the top of Pikes Peak, got a full charge, and then decided to go down the mountain. 
What they forgot was it has regenerative braking. Ah. <laughs> and this thing is going to be charging those batteries without any kind of climbs or energy usage. Yep. And they're going to boil the sulfuric acid out of the batteries. So they reconsidered the engineers and said, you know what? We got to get rid of this charge. So for two and a half hours, they drove it around the parking lot up on top of Pike's Peak <laughs> to get rid of some of that charge so they could get back down the hill. Can you imagine how gas cars say, oh no, we've got too much gas. <laughs> we gotta burn it out. <laughs> and you know, somebody was pointing out, I think it was Mark in one of our other um, uh, podcasts, when they go to uh, San Diego, you know, you go up the mountains there just yes. before you go down in. When you're going downhill for that five or 10 miles, you're actually accruing miles. It's like being connected to a supercharger. They found that out with the <clears> Tesla <throat> semis as they were running them in Colorado and yeah. other mountainous places. And actually, yeah, I've done that San Diego drive a billion times now, and I can tell you, it would be really nice to have an EV going back into Phoenix from there just to get all that juice back. Well, it looks like we're out of time. Save your questions. We'll um, save the ones that were collected that we didn't get to this time, and we'll do them Thursday morning at the podcast. And as usual, we're having a lot of fun. We hope that you guys are. We really appreciate you joining us for these productions. And uh, we will see you Thursday at 8.30 Mountain Standard Time. Same time, same place. Thank you for joining us.